I'm really glad now to introduce a speaker that I've been looking forward to hearing. I believe, Kelsey, am I right that we can just uh, go to the first slide? Okay. Raul, while I'm going to the first slide, is your video is your audio working? I think so. Can you hear me? I hear you. Absolutely. Okay. So, Raul has over 35 years experience, and this is really interesting because it's very, very rare that I find someone that I can talk to who is in academia now, in startups now, with extensive experience with Fortune 500 companies. And like most engineers and scientists, I don't have a, the slightest idea what he did for those Fortune 500 companies. So Raul, welcome. And first, uh, tell us about yourself, because I think that's, it's very interesting. Sure, sure. Uh, so, um, you know, I, I, as, as it says there, I'm a computer scientist. I got a PhD in computer science and uh, did a lot of work in that area in big companies. I used to run a big division of a public company. Came down to Florida, tried to retire, got bored. <laughs> and uh, and uh, and then uh, started to just do startups. Uh, had a couple of successes with startups. Um, and now I, I just I have my own little research institute where I work on ideas and we kind of spin them out into companies and uh, just try to keep myself busy. Nice, nice. Well, when I read what you sent me on estate planning, I was just like, God, this is going to help us further develop the estate planning profession and when you get a fresh view from somebody like you. Good. Would you like me to put up my slides? Yes, please. They've got to right. be better. Than Let mine. me know if you <laughs> I don't know about that. I haven't got the 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 the, the dummy, but uh, let's see. Uh, there we go. Let me know if you let me know if you see the slides and you look uh, right. Yep. All right. So uh, let me get going. And I, I think the, you know, as the title says, uh, and, and, you know, like a lot of people, um, estate planning is not something that's sort of fresh in mind uh, for most of us. We're doing whatever we're doing. And at least for most of us, what happens is, you know, early in your career, you're just trying to support yourself. And then, you know, a little bit after that, you have a little bit of money, but and you kind of do the usual things and it's you know if you're very lucky and things go your way that you have enough money that you can actually do something and but then the question becomes what and um so i just wanted to give my a little bit of my journey on on trying to learn this uh, this field and give give some perspective uh, which hopefully will be helpful for the people that are professionals in the area so just a little bit of background on me. Uh, so as I said, I was a computer scientist, electrical engineer. So the stuff you see in front of you is stuff that I've worked on. The thing on the very left is a microprocessor. I used to be a microprocessor architect for a company called Digital Equipment Corporation, which was then that group was acquired by Intel. So those kinds of processors. Um, it's the stuff that the picture that's in the middle top is actually a, a the design system to build the things on the left and so i i was in a company that did that uh the stuff on the right is a wireless power company that i built um here in florida and we sold it to qualcomm and what i do these days just for my for my i guess day job whatever that is is i work on autonomous vehicle research at the bottom middle picture where um you know we're trying to figure out how autonomous uh, how, where uh, uh, artificial intelligence sorts of technologies can help with autonomy and then the other area that i work in quite a bit is education so i ended up giving a ted talk on education so i, I want to give you this background because what you don't see in there is financial planning estate planning and all of that sort of stuff um, and I, I guess I wanted to make the point that, um, I'm, you know, many of the things that I do very much used to complexity. You know, there's technical complexity. You know, if you think about trying to build autonomy in a car, well, you know, just as a slight aside, uh, if you ask most people, you know, what does it take to get a license? 
they might say, you know, six months, uh, enough to learn how to drive a car for a human being. Uh, in order for us to replicate that for a car, uh, it, it turns out it's a lot uh, more complicated. And the reason is, uh, if you're a human being, you understand things like if you see a leaf on the road, you can just run over it. But if you see stones, you can't. And all that experiential knowledge uh, that human beings build up uh, you know, since they were born is actually very much of a part of how, to, how do you operate in the environment. So the AI systems have to figure that out. And then legal complexity. So when <laughs> that's actually the deal deck from uh, from uh, the Qualcomm transaction, and I know a lot of that uh, deal deck pretty intimately. Uh, and so I guess my real point was it's not that complexity is not new to me, but kind of walking into estate planning, um, I kind of um, my first reaction is is this all unnecessarily complex? Um, and um, and kind of a lot of the people I was dealing with, uh, there's a lot of disaggregated players. There are CPAs, there are state attorneys, there are life insurance companies, and investment professionals. Um, and um, uh, it's as, as a person that's trying to figure this stuff out, uh, it's not entirely straightforward to connect between all these people, uh, nor even understand sometimes in the beginning what their competence sets are so you know how to classify them. There's a, as we've discovered, there's a lot of technical jargon. By the way, my field has, a, my computer science has a lot of technical jargon. Uh, uh, and, uh, and, and the issue is, uh, you know, technical jargon is necessary, uh, as it is in my field, but uh, what we always talk about is how do you turn that into uh, things that the person consuming it can uh, absorb at the level that they need to. Um, and so abstraction, this idea of abstraction is very powerful. Most of you use computers and you know you look at things like uh, in the operating systems, you have ideas such as folders or windows. These are all terms we came up in computer science because they were familiar with people, not because they're necessarily connected to the tech technology underneath. And that bridging is, it turns out to be very important because it forms mental models that people can use in order to deal with the complexity of the, the things that are underneath. Uh, the other observation is every single person I dealt with wanted very similar information repetitively provided in their own format. And I just kind of wondered, well, why isn't there some standard for this? You know, we have health records. Why aren't there kind of, you know, uh, health, you know, as it were, financial records that that are, of course, securely held, but but can be easily transmitted, so we don't have to repetitively do the same thing. And then finally, um, a real obsession with uh, tax avoidance. Of course, tax avoidance is very important, and not to say it's not very important, but I get the feeling this is viewed as the primary value generator. And uh, it kind of reminds me a little bit of, there, there's this movie, George Clooney movie, um, I think it's called Up in the Air. And he's the main character who, who, uh, uh, who has an interesting view on life, actually is obsessed with airline points. And then there's some interesting conversation in the movie where when somebody calls him on, you know, the fact that he's obsessed on airline points, he says, it's, it's actually all about the points. And of course, that's actually not what it's about. So, so I think the issue is that, the, from my point of view, the, the the tax avoidance is extremely important, and there's a lot of focus on it. But um, you know, that's not sort of the bigger picture. So, kind of, what's the bigger picture? From my point of view, you know, is there sort of as as a as a person trying to figure this out? Uh, the first thing is. How do, how do I develop my objective? You know, once you get past the point of, you know, uh, uh, you, you, you don't, have, like when you get to a point where the money you have is actually material and can actually change people's lives, both for positive and negative, um, what should the objectives be and how should I think about those objectives? It turns out to be the most important thing. And, um, uh, and uh, if you're just walking into that, or if you're not intimately familiar with these concepts, or uh, then what you really want is experiential learning from others 
that are trying to do uh, deal with the same issues. And you want to understand variations of what's happened and, and all that sort of stuff. So development of objectives is, is a really a big part of, uh, I believe, you know, what people would value and do value. The second thing is risk assessment and management. Um, so, uh, you know, one of the things that I always wonder about when I hear talks about things where, you know, some edge condition is being talked about at the at, uh, relative to the IRS or the tax court or something like that. Of course, this is extremely important when you're at that level, but if you're, as a client, you're kind of thinking, as a customer, you're kind of thinking about long horizons. And you're thinking about long horizons, presumably, in the context of uh, um, um, maybe you're not the only person that has to make some of the decision making. And also, do you want to intimately be connected to the, bu the bubbling tax code and the regulatory code? Uh, and so, um, uh, so kind of an understanding of risk at multiple levels uh, and kind of trying to figure out what, I, what you know, in, in the engineering world, we would call it robustness, right? So, so you can engineer something where it's very, it's, it's extremely high performance, like, you know, maybe I have to use the car analogy, it's high performance, but, 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 but kind of brittle because any little thing can break it. Or you can engineer things that have much higher robustness, but they not, may not be the highest performance. Okay. And so that idea is something that's extremely important in my view, uh, but it's not, doesn't come across um, uh, um, when, we, when I deal with a lot of the professionals in this space. And of course, the tools, the legal structures, you know, they're there, they, they're, they're, to be, they're to be used. Um, uh, in my mind, they're sort of, Tools, so therefore, in many ways, they're the they're lowest value statement. Uh, just maybe one more thought here. Um, uh, um, what I wonder about when I kind of walked into this is uh, why is every lawyer building their own unique version of similar information in, in terms of legal language? Almost isn't there a preferred method of common language that's been tested? And just using the analogy of what might we might think about in, in in engineering as well, and and so that's you know that's kind of a, just a thought that came came to me because um, what you don't want is if the objective is to be the same, but the crafting of the language actually causes the issue, right? So so. So how do you deal with complexity? You know, underneath you've got these tax codes, you've got real life conditions that that are uh, that are causing all sorts of uh, uh, things to happen, and and uh, you know certainly in engineering what we do is we kind of have this high uh, intense idea of abstraction. So so just you know since I'm going to just use the analogies from computing because most of you are used to using computers, but we kind of build these abstractions. Where in computing, where you don't know about the transistors that are underneath your computers, right? You, so you don't deal with those transistors. You don't even deal with the operating systems. You keep abstracting up to these things called windows and, and, and even above that with websites and so on. So the idea of higher level abstractions that people can deal with is very powerful. And the question is, what are the right abstractions in this space, right? The, se the second thing is visualization. It's extremely difficult to see dynamic information, especially with kind of when you're trying to sh sh stress test, you know, various things that can happen. Who dies first? Who dies second? Uh, you know, I don't, a bad spouse syndrome or something like that. It's extremely difficult to see that in a textual form, even in a PowerPoint form. Y you kind of want to see it in a much more much more visual context and um and so that's uh, uh, because that's how human beings absorb and in fact to tell you the truth human beings absorb things in a visual form but also in a storytelling form storytelling is extremely important in in, in terms of uh terms of how people absorb information and then finally in this complex set you know like when when we uh, when we think about sort of in my world complex software systems, and there's a lot of uncertainty and risk, the way you manage that typically is, in, in, there's a methodology called agile, but all it really is saying is, you don't try to 
bite off everything. You sort of build an incremental process to get there. And what you're doing is you go to the next step and you sort of build comfort levels on where you are, and then you go to the next step after that and so on. And so, uh, so uh, the question is, what does that look like in this space? Um, and of course, all of this is you know, based on the thing we talked about before, what the objectives uh, uh, are that you've chosen to go after. Um, yeah, I, I think I, I try to take a shot at uh, what this means in this space. Uh, you, know, uh, you know, there's this notion of uh, how you deal with complexity is you, first of all, you have to sort of contextualize what the space looks like. You have to build a map of what, what you're dealing with. And that typically consists of what's my world today? You know, where do I want it to be? How can it change, uh, et cetera? Um, uh, the players that are in this are humans. <laughs> so, you know, human uh, frailty, as it were, is a part of this picture. Uh, and then the pathways are the sort of the step-by-step -step process that can help with this exploration, right? Um, the, I guess the point I want to get across is exploration and collective knowledge is typically a key part of how you absorb this information. Uh, yeah. So I guess in this world, in my, and I don't, you know, I don't claim to be any expert in this world, but, you know, what I kind of, you know, in most of the conversations I walk into with professionals in this space, whether it's CPAs, um, uh, life insurance companies or, or life insurance agents and all the professionals, they, they are very much operating the equivalent of, you know, if, if, if I started talking to people about low level operating system drivers, Right, we're talking about low-level mechanisms uh, often, and kind of where 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 nobody seems to want to start is there are high-level structures that have basic properties that we're not all we haven't absorbed to the same levels as the, the professionals. Right, there's you know there's corporations, there's trust. There was the original reason for trust. Yeah, there there are um, sort of. Uh, uh, um, uh, uh, over time, a, 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 there have been movements of, of, of these, these basic structures and, and equity structures and so on. So there's sort of this high, very high level uh, um, kind of uh, uh, building blocks that exist that various people have uh, various understandings of. Right. And so without that level set, what happens is when you walk in with sort of a loan payback structures or there's sort of this understanding that people understand this, but they don't. Right. And so without that understanding, it's very difficult to absorb it. And then, of course, you've got the human behaviors and all of that. Let's see. I think I'm already I'm being somewhat repetitive here. OK. Um, yeah. So. Uh, as we're dealing with this, uh, uh, what are the kind of impediments to progress? Uh, so, so I think business models are a bit of an impediment to progress here. So, of course, you know the people that have products to sell, they have commission-based structures, and so there's, you know, there's this kind of feeling of implicit bias, and so that gets in the way of trust, right? Um, and so that, you know, so therefore you can't do much in that space. Um, also, there's a lot of people, especially on the investment side, you know, that, that want to have structures which are, uh, let me take a percentage of your estate and just manage it for you and, and th this kind of thing. And, um, um, and so, you know, you kind of wonder about whether value is being generated uh, uh, or value is being produced in that space. And, you know, I have my own view on it. Others may have a different view. And then you, even if you, even time and materials, you know, I'm going to charge per hour, things like that. It's probably the best of the three so far, but you know, it's it, it, it's still sort of this implicit, non-aligned relative to the to the uh, to the client. And so the question is, is there a business model that that's uh, sort of uh, much more aligned that can be invented here, where where you know, it pays to have a much bigger and uh, struck. It pays to have a much broader and deeper relationship where where there's joint interest. Uh, let me just give you an example of this. You know, when I when I did the um, Qualcomm uh, transaction, 
um, the whole the whole market capitalization uh, for the company I was that I had White Power was uh, less than a million dollars. And when Qualcomm actually gave us the uh, the, uh, the the offer, uh, which was quite interesting, um, well, we had to go off and get uh, attorneys, corporate attorneys, to help close uh, the transaction. And we were told uh, that would probably be you know several hundred thousand dollars to close the transaction. And if you have a market capitalization of a you know less than a million dollars, what that means is that you know, if the transaction doesn't go through, then you can be out of business. So, so I actually just went around to the top firms uh, in the U.S., uh, the corporate attorney firms, M&A firms, and I said, here's my problem. Um, I want a solution where I'm capped on the low side and, and uh, you get upside, upside um, uh, participate on the upside. And I actually got a deal like that, actually with a, with a, a very good firm in Tampa, um, uh, and uh, and we we set up such a structure. So and it worked actually fantastically because they were highly aligned with with uh, with what I was trying to do, and they never tried to get ahead of me, you know, in terms of what they what they uh, the work they actually did, and they were also. Sensing what the whether the deal would close or not, and in that sense, they were very, very uh, useful in monitoring the overall transaction. So, so the question is: Is there a structure here where 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 uh, you know this can be done? Because if there is, I think it starts going in some interesting directions. So, uh, like I said, I'm a computer scientist. And so when I look at the space, I often start thinking about high tech sort of things that I wonder make sense here. So one thing that kind of makes sense to me is um, communities for customer learning. That is uh, uh, um, high net worth individuals um, that, uh, that, that, you know, they're not talking about the details of their estates. Uh, they're 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 talking about sort of how they deal with uh, common issues uh, and uh, um, the that that turns out to be extremely useful, right? So even as I went through the, my own process, I just sort of re started reaching out to other people and and uh, you know the 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 the, slide, the the journey that you see the the link you see down there is sort of some level of result of that. But I just wonder if there's a much more active kind of uh, thing that can be done there, and where people can share uh, share their uh, uh, how they've dealt with it, or ask other people, uh, and therefore uh, there's some collective learning that goes on. Uh, automation of the standard norms, uh, forms of legal structures. You know, so so again, a lot of these uh, standardization in my mind has has. Uh, has power uh, simply because um, uh, from a client point of view, I know if something is standard, it's been tested in various ways uh, in other places, and somebody specialized on it. And so I, I you know, I, I noticed in the area of private foundations, as an example, people are, you know, not only standardizing but uh, also uh, building the 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 uh, uh, services uh, behind it so that the management tasks are minimized and things like that. Uh, visualization products and with what, what if analysis, that seems ideal. Some, somebody's going to do this if they haven't already done this. And then sort of open source for uh, uh, standard contract terms. Again, I think I mentioned this. Well, it's not clear to me why the same things have to be done differently at a per lawyer level. Uh, um, so, uh, uh, by the way, I, so as I went through this process, as this has been over about, a, I don't know, over about, uh, a year, I guess, um, I, I just wrote down my experiences. And, uh, so if you're interested, you can read it. And, you know, the, the starting point, as you'll see, is, uh, I started to go down the, the process of how do I even think about objectives? And, um, and I, and I wrote this title because 
I think the objective is ma managing family, family happiness, but you, you never know about the dis disgruntled spouse, I suppose. Let me see. Oh, okay. Well, I just thought since since Alan has a very interesting sense of humor, I I, I would add my own <laughs> uh, take at it. So this is actually I wrote this in a Forbes article, but this is comparing a a, uh, a you know what's more uh, sustainable and a better solution for autonomous transportation, a donkey or a or a uh, or a uh, Tesla. And uh, this is like sort of the standard marketing chart. So you start out with, you know, green, you know, uh, so, you know, obviously a donkey is excellent, you know, it's uh, green in, green out. Uh, and Tesla is pretty good, electric, right? So homing mechanism, the donkeys are very, very good at, you know, getting home. And uh, I think Teslas are okay. I'm not sure they're as good as donkeys, but they're still, they're okay. Conflict avoidance, Nick, as in avoiding hitting things and avoiding objects and things like that. Self-preservation, you know, evolution has built a very, very strong sense of self-preservation. So conflict avoidance for donkeys is extremely good. And Teslas aren't bad. You know, don't jump off a cliff, though that's always good. Um, uh, it's a similar thing. And then, of course, finally, you know, if you have two donkeys, uh, you can get a third one. Uh, uh, you can't do that with Teslas. So. Um, that's kind of what I had. Um, Alan, I don't know if that was useful, but uh, I don't know if the audience has any questions. Yeah, let me see if we have, let me find my question box here. My question box disappeared on me. Let's see here. So uh, yeah, one question here is, as, a, as an estate planning lawyer, uh, what would you recommend for a first meeting that that you didn't see that didn't happen for you in first meetings. Um, yeah, I think the for, for for me it would have been useful um, to just get a little perspective on on uh, on um, what this whole thing looks like, right? I mean, what, what like, the, like I'll say the very very highest level objectives, right? What are you trying to do? How are you trying to do it? And do you know what you want to do? Uh, that that was the thing that uh, that that I found missing because it, you know a lot of the meetings came down to what are your assets? Uh, uh, let's let's get those. Um, and then the objectives were sort of asked for, but you know of course in the beginning I I didn't really have a good view on them. So how you build those is, is like how do you build your objectives? Maybe is is a question. And to what degree of maturity, you know, does the client in your guys' case ha have that? Some people may have everything figured out, but uh, a lot of people don't. And it, to the degree it's not figured out, is the degree to which the rest of the process is going to be very noisy. Right. Right. And then. Aside from creditor protection and estate tax avoidance, is, which honestly is what most affluent clients are calling about, what what do you think the objectives are that, that we should remind clients about more often? Uh, you know, the client has to, in my mind, the client has to build a, some kind of model of where they want to go. And most of us haven't thought about it, right? I mean, we're doing whatever we're doing. And, and, and you know, just this 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 process of thinking about okay, you know, so there's kids, they might be grandkids. There 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 is the the transfer of assets. You've got these high level things. I mean, even something as simple as a, a conceptual model where where you have, of course, income taxes, which most of most of us are familiar with, but then they have estate taxes, and then um, and then even the mechanics of how these things intersect with what happens in your life, you know, these are not, for most people, for most of us, they're not clear things, right? Uh, and so uh, part, of, part of it is just ramping up, for us, it's ramping up to a level that we can understand in what context you're having the conversation with us. Right, right, okay. Um, 
but here's one, understanding the behavioral bias is crucial in decision-making. Dealing with the tax code is different than dealing with people's emotions, psychology, and biases. David, yeah. made, that, made, David made that point. So we should be less code heads and more caring, I guess? Not so much caring, but you know, it's, it's sort of this ba basic question, right? Like, let, let me give you an answer. Let's say, the, uh, let me give you an extreme example. Let's say I, um, uh, I have a point of view for whatever reason, I'm gonna give everything away to charity, okay? Well, you, the conversation you're gonna have with me in that context is very different than, you know, the other side, right? So, 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 like the first conversation, it seems to me is sort of what you know. What do you want to do? And and it, you know, I, I, like I can tell you, but at least if you were to talk to me a year and a half ago, I hadn't thought about it enough to tell you <laughs> what I really wanted to do. So, because most of us are in our professions, we're kind of looking down what we're doing, and we've got the next professional thing we're working on. So, it takes a while, in my view. Uh, for the, you know, to kind of even learn what you, like what the direction ought to be. And so, so to the degree, and this is going back to one of the slides I was talking about. That, so, so I know this doesn't pay, but to the degree that somebody can help with um, helping develop the objectives, and I don't mean tell somebody, but here are what other people did. Here's a, a, a different circumstances. Some people went in this direction for the following reason, right? Because once that starts getting laid out, I think then you know you, then you can start developing strategies and you know things underneath and so on. But in the beginning, you know uh, you know we're all on the bicycle wheel or the or what, you know hamster wheel, whatever that right that right the, the term is, and um, it's very difficult to sort of get yourself above it enough to know what, where to go. Let's go back to cars now. I want to hear about cars. W yeah. What am I what am I going to be driving or what's going to be available to me in 10 years? Uh it's it's extremely likely that uh, uh public transportation systems will have a have a fair amount of autonomy because they're uh they, you know they're sort of can be fixed routes. Delivery vehicles, little delivery vehicles, pedestrian follow me vehicles are, are going to be there. Um, but if you, I assume, I'm assuming you're asking the question from an autonomous vehicle point of view. But um, the uh, but, but like public uh, uh, passenger car, traditional passenger cars uh, becoming autonomous, that's the l longest pole. And and uh, uh, and, the, and the reason it's the longest pole is there's a lot of things that we have to yet to figure out. Uh, just as an example. If you're driving with your teenage daughter, I'm just, I don't know if I'm being <laughs> there, and, and you're teaching their, her how to drive, and, they're, and she's very nervous because they, they haven't had the experience of driving, uh, you can tell that immediately from their behavior, right? You can just, as a human being, you can just see it, right? Okay. When an autonomous vehicle is in that similar situation, uh, we don't have a language to transmit this information out. I don't know what I'm doing right now. Yeah, yeah, I don't know if you got if you have a Tesla or or a you know Mercedes or whatever, but you actually need that because if you don't have it, uh, it's it's a uh, uh, it's actually becomes a, a safety issue. Um, and then you get into all sorts of other issues since you guys are actually I oh I forgot to mention this. Okay, uh, so uh, so autonomous vehicles are new. And so people believe, geez, the law is always lagging, and so it's going to eventually catch up. And you know that's kind of the general headset. But what's interesting about autonomy is actually there's a whole body of law that already exists for handling autonomy in terms of transportation. It's just it's called equestrian law. And it's from a hundred years ago, and it, they had all the stuff pounded out about okay, if you have accidents. What happens is, uh, you know, it's your fault. If this happens, by the way, and there's also this concept that they had in the old days where the horse just went crazy. Nobody knows what happened. <laughs> so, so, uh, so, um, uh, 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 I, I guess uh, what what I'm trying to say is that from a technological point of view, things will progress, and they'll progress in 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 a funny way, um, uh, kind of by, small going up. 
as it were, sm small use models and so on. Um, the but the but the uh, the legal structures I think well, will kind of I guess I guess lag on that. Uh, the, the 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 big thing will be there's a lot of big models uh, business models that will actually shift along the way, right? So so like as, as, like we use them just like just to give you an example. Uh, most of us may you know order a pizza. Okay, so that's if you think about it, or you go to the grocery store like Publix. If you think about it, it's kind of a funny thing we do. We get into a multi-ton vehicle with ourselves and our time. We go to a Publix. We take I don't know five pounds, and then we take a multi-ton vehicle and bring it back to our house. If you just think about that. That that seems like what, what what's that about? You know, from an all sorts of points of view, right? And so you should expect what will happen is in the future, you'll probably just get on a phone and say, deliver this to me, and a little robot will just deliver it to you. You don't have to do these multi-ton vehicle trips, right? Uh, so that's that kind of stuff, automated parking lots, all of that sort of stuff is going to happen, and it's going to slowly just start seeping in, and if, you, know, you, you won't even notice it. Yeah, beautiful. Okay, well, I can't thank you enough, Raul. That was a great presentation, kind of thinking through different industries. I'm sure we'll have you back. Your article that I read is was beautiful. Uh, Jay offered proof rock poem <laughs> on it works. Fantastic. So thanks everybody for attending and uh, we will see you next Saturday at 11 if you are a glutton for punishment. Bye-bye. Okay.